Deliberate cold exposure is a very potent stimulus for the brain and body. We experience an increase in metabolism, mental health and performance, an enhancement in mental acuity and the ability to focus. We can learn to maintain mental clarity while our body is in a state of stress. Epinephrine and dopamine all increase. It makes us feel good and it continues to make us feel good even after we get out of the cold environment. Temperature is a very potent stimulus for the brain and body. That also means that it carries certain hazards if it's not done correctly. There are important effects of what we call mindset. If we are doing something deliberately and we believe that it's going to be good for us, it actually can lead to a different set of physiological effects than if something is happening to us against our will or without our control. Meaning that you are placing yourself into a cold environment on purpose in order to extract a particular set of benefits. And one of the most common questions I get when discussing the use of cold for sake of mental or physical performance, metabolism, etc., is how cold should it be? How cold depends on your cold tolerance, your core metabolism, and a number of other features that there is simply no way I could know or have access to. So I would like you to use this rule of thumb. If you are using deliberate cold exposure, the environment that you place yourself into should place your mind into a state of, whoa, I would really like to get out of this environment, but I can stay in safely. The second most common question I get about deliberate cold exposure is whether or not cold showers are as good, better, or worse than cold water immersion up to the neck with your feet and hands submerged also is going to be the most effective. Second best would be cold shower. Third best would be to go outside with a minimum amount of clothing, but of course, clothing that is culturally appropriate and that would allow you to experience cold to the point where you would almost want to shiver or start shivering. So let's talk about protocols for enhancing mental health and performance using deliberate cold exposure. What happens when we get into cold? is that we experience an increase in norepinephrine, in noradrenaline release and in adrenaline release. The fact that cold exposure, deliberate or no, increases norepinephrine and epinephrine in our brain and body means that it is a very reliable stimulus for increasing norepinephrine and epinephrine. That's sort of an obvious statement, but that obvious statement can be leveraged to systematically build up what we call resilience. Now, when we experience a stressor in life, whether or not it's something bad happens in our relationship or something bad happens in the world and we feel stress, that stress is the consequence of increases in norepinephrine and epinephrine in our brain and body. Very similar, if not identical, to the kinds of increases that come from deliberate cold exposure. So deliberate cold exposure is an opportunity to deliberately stress our body. And yet, because it's deliberate and because we can take certain steps, which I'll describe in a moment, we can learn to maintain mental clarity. We can learn to maintain calm while our body is in a state of stress. And that can be immensely useful when encountering stressors in other parts of life. And that's what we call resilience or grit, our ability to, or mental toughness, our ability to lean into challenge or to tolerate challenge while keeping our head straight, so to speak. So one simple protocol for increasing resilience is to pick a temperature that's uncomfortable of shower or cold immersion, and then to get in for a certain duration of time and then to get out. So the way to think about norepinephrine and epinephrine in this context of building mental resilience is that you have two options. You can either try to extend the duration of time that you are in the deliberate cold exposure. So going from one minute to 75 seconds to two minutes and so on over a period of days. Or one way to approach this and the way that I particularly favor is to take the context of the day and the moment into account and start to be able to sense the release of epinephrine, epinephrine, excuse me, and norepinephrine in our brain and body and see those as walls that we want to climb over in order to build resilience and to start counting the number of walls that we traverse and the distance between those walls as we do deliberate cold exposure. Okay. The next question that I always get is what should my mental state be while I'm exposing myself to this uncomfortable yet safe condition of cold? Well, you have two options and there are probably other options as well. One is to try and calm yourself to remain 
remain as mentally still as possible. The other is to lean into that challenge and so to grind it out. Sometimes it's easier to calm yourself. One way to do that is through double inhales through the nose and extended exhales through the mouth or simply by trying to control your breathing and reduce the pace of your breathing and increase the volume of your breathing. Another very common question is how often to do deliberate cold exposure. It's tough to make a recommendation on that based on any peer-reviewed study, although there are a few in humans that point to a threshold of 11 minutes total per week. So that's total throughout the week, divided into two or four sessions of two or three minutes or so. Deliberate cold exposure has a very powerful effect on the release of dopamine in our brain and body. And this is one of the main reasons why people continue to do deliberate cold exposure. Basically, it makes us feel good and it continues to make us feel good even after we get out of the cold environment. In fact, some people would say they don't feel good in the cold environment. It's all stress for them, but afterwards they feel great. Almost everybody who does deliberate cold exposure will say, yeah, it was stressful, I didn't enjoy it, or I eventually grew to like it, but that I always feel better afterwards. And then that feeling lasts a very long period of time. And I think it's almost certain that those experiences that people report relate to these increases in dopamine and in concert with the increases in norepinephrine also explain the other effect that's commonly reported, which is an enhancement in mental acuity and the ability to focus. Now I'd like to shift our attention to the effects of deliberate cold exposure on metabolism. Deliberate cold exposure converts one particular kind of fat cell, the white fat cell, which is a very low metabolic output cell. It's basically a storage site for energy in the body, fat cells, to a different type of fat cell, which is the beige fat cell, called beige because it's actually beige or slightly brown under the microscope, or even to brown fat cells, which are very dark under the microscope and dark because they contain mitochondria and are very metabolically and thermogenically active. So beige fat and brown fat is very good at raising our metabolism and helps burn white fat. Now, of course, it does that only in the context of a caloric deficit, but it can actually help create that caloric deficit. Having more beige fat and brown fat can increase your overall core metabolism. In other words, the number of calories that you burn per day, and therefore the number of calories that you need to either maintain or to lose weight. Should you get into the heat afterward or before or not at all? And this is where we can point to the so-called Soberg principle that to achieve the greatest increases in metabolism through deliberate cold exposure, you want to force yourself to reheat on your own after the deliberate cold exposure, meaning you wouldn't want to go from the cold shower to a hot shower or from the cold shower to a sauna. Rather, if you were going to start with a hot shower or you're going to start with a sauna, that you would end with the cold and then you would reheat naturally. Deliberate cold exposure that evokes shivering from the muscles causes the release of a molecule called succinate from the muscles and that succinate plays a key role in activating brown fat thermogenesis, which you now have heard about and understand as critical to the increases in metabolism caused by deliberate cold exposure. So what this means is if you want to increase your metabolism, end on cold, that's the Soberg principle, and as best you can, try and get to the point where you are shivering either when you are in the cold exposure or immediately afterwards. Now I'd like to shift our attention to the use of deliberate cold exposure for sake of physical performance. If your main goal is hypertrophy and strength, it is probably best to avoid cold water immersion and ice bath immersion in the four hours immediately following that strength and or hypertrophy training. Now there are nice data pointing to the fact that doing cold water immersion after a hard run, so endurance training, or even sprint and interval training, or after a weight workout where your main focus is on performance of those movements, or after a skill training workout where your main focus is on performance of those movements, that there's no reason to think that that cold water immersion or ice bath or cold shower would inhibit the progress or the stimulus that would lead to progress that occurred during that training session. If you are somebody who experiences a lot of delayed onset muscle soreness, taking a cold shower after your training or getting into a cold immersion after your training, even if it's a few hours later, ought to help. And if you are doing particularly intense training, then you probably want to ratchet up 
the number of cold exposure sessions that you're doing, even if those have to be done on separate days from your training, because a lot of the inflammatory effects of training, endurance and strength training are actually occurring some hours away from the training stimulus. So it's not just that inflammation goes up radically during training, which it often can, but that it can occur even in the days and even weeks afterwards, depending on how intense and how long duration that training is. So deliberate cold exposure is very powerful as an anti-inflammatory tool. Now, as a final topic related to the use of deliberate cold exposure for improving health and performance, I'd like to touch on this theme that exists online, on social media, on YouTube, and in various fitness communities of using deliberate cold exposure to the groin, in particular to the testicles, in order to try and increase testosterone. There are a couple of mechanisms by which one might experience increases in testosterone as a consequence of deliberate cold exposure. The first is somewhat direct, which is that anytime you cool a body surface, that if it's cold enough, you're going to get vasoconstriction. And then subsequently, you're going to get a rebound increase in vasodilation, meaning you're going to constrict the blood vessels in that area. And then after the cold is removed, there's going to be more blood flow to that area. And of course, blood flow relates to organ health and tissue health generally. So perfusion of that region and those uh, and the gonads, to be specific, with additional blood, you could imagine in some ways increasing testosterone. That's reasonably plausible. The other probably more likely mechanism relates to the dopamine increases caused by cold exposure that we talked about earlier. Again, anytime you have a somewhat stressful stimulus, but in particular with cold exposure, it seems that the catecholamines, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine all increase. And dopamine is known to be in the pathway that can stimulate testosterone. And so while there isn't a direct relationship between dopamine stimulating testosterone, there is an interesting pathway whereby dopamine increases can trigger increases in things like luteinizing hormone, which can trigger increases in testosterone as well as estrogen for that matter. If you are going to do deliberate cold exposure, you are going to increase your core body temperature. And that makes sense if you think about how deliberate cold exposure can increase metabolism by increasing thermogenesis. What that all means is that if you are doing your deliberate cold exposure early in the day, you are going to get yet a further increase in core body temperature that would be associated with wakefulness, your ability to be alert that morning or throughout the day, and so on. It also means that if you do your deliberate cold exposure very late in the evening or at night, so... 6 p.m., 7 p.m., 9 p.m., and so on, you are going to increase your core body temperature. And if you recall, a decrease in core body temperature of one to three degrees is not just beneficial, but is necessary in order to get into deep sleep and remain in deep sleep. So the takeaway from this is deliberate cold exposure done properly will increase your core body temperature and make you feel more alert. So if you're doing it early in the day, that's probably terrific given that most of us want to be alert during the day. However, if you do it too late in the day, evening or night, it can disrupt sleep by way of disrupting your core body temperature. <music>